Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi, this is Ben. You're listening to the Otaku Generation Podcast, or you're very confused. Well, welcome to Otaku Generation. Generation. Next generation radio for otaku. Our podcast brings all the otaku to the yard. You know, after watching hours of anime, you start to wonder, why don't they make shows around other topics like a magical superhero slash vegan chef? We're still podcasting from OGNetworks.tv in a basement where we wonder why they haven't made an anime about podcasters. Show number 764, January 29th, 2020. With this week's topic, 2020 Winter Season Impressions, Part 3. And now, cereals you haven't heard of. Shiba Inu Crunchies. Number 2, Alligator Pops. Number 3, Bishojo Loops. Number 4, Kappa Krispies. And number 5, Frosted Fanboy Flakies. And now, a person who's planning on building a giant OG duck on the Minecraft server, Alan Chase. Indeed. Indeed. I uh, eventually will we'll get to it. <laughs> I'll hail the mighty duck. Yeah. Well, I uh, I started uh, amassing up supplies to do it. And uh, what, I have a what lot... exactly are ducks constructed of in the Minecraft universe? Uh, well, there are no ducks and they're chickens that look like ducks. But please tell me you're not ma- lava. <laughs> Yeah. Please tell uh, me you're not making a giant duck statue out of chickens. Uh, no, but I <laughs> do plan on uh, having it spit out chicken eggs, and when they <laughs> they hit the ground, uh, there's a sort of a random seed, and if the seed kicks off right, uh, then chickens form. So I don't know exactly what the firing mechanism is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be a button or if it's mm. just going to observe uh, people or things walking through the space or if it's just going to start firing them off in the middle of the night. I don't really know. Haven't decided yet. <laughs> but anyway, hi, hello, everyone. I am Alan. Hi, I'm Matt. And hi, I am Paul. Yes, uh, no Bryce this week. So um, so please tell us about this magic giant duck cloaca you've developed. Uh, I am I'm not. We're going to get into our topic because... Plenty of cloacas coming up later in the podcast, Matt. Uh, Just relax. <laughs> we, we got a lot of stuff to get through so that we could stop talking about all the new season review stuff. Um, okay, so let's, let's just, you know, been... Let's just get started with the first one, which is... Okay, our our first one up is A3 Act Addict Actors from Funimation. Um, this is also sort of titled A3 Season, Spring, and Summer. Uh, based on a mobile game, it's about resurrecting a failing theater. Um, basically, this teenage girl goes by the Mankey Theater and is there just in time to see that they're they're going to have the the sign torn down and the person who owns the mortgage on the place is going to turn it into a bar or a I don't know speakeasy or something yeah something and uh through in sincere and and piteous groveling, they managed to convince the uh, the guy who owns the 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 loan on the place that if they can fully staff up and put on four seasons of successful shows and pay back the loan, they will get to keep their theater. Otherwise, okay. they lose it. They are, of course, handicapped in this effort by the fact that they are fucking incompetent losers. And they have, like, one guy. 
Yeah, yeah, it really is one guy. This, so this gigantic theater troupe is down to one guy, but no, they're going to save the school drama club. Mm. Except saving the school drama club when these are putative adults just does not play out well on the screen. Yeah, so... Uh, on, on the other hand, they do appear to be at about the mental development level of middle schoolers. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just basically what it says on the tin it's not so much about acting it's this about overacting because i mean it's the, the, the people like keep acting at the screen in the most terrible way declaiming shakespeare and just you know the endless grandiose fashion yeah this is sort of the, one of those weird things where you have the entertainment industry talking about itself and there's sort of this self-conscious attitude of like over dramatizing the dramatics of it i think they're trying to uh, sabotage the competition because anybody who takes this show as a model for what's going to work in the uh in the cutthroat market of theater is probably doomed to disappointment despite what our starry-eyed protagonist tells you that if you just work really really hard everything will work out even though you know absolutely nothing about this shit that you're doing yeah you are doomed to disappointment if you watch this show yeah. And I think that's that's all we really need to say about yeah, it. You're... None of us are saying anything of any great fanfare mm -hmm. about this thing. It's completely worth missing. I, I should point out that this looks like it's it's trying to set itself up as as a reverse harem show, kind of because um, the the typical things in in this kind of genre, like Idol Master, have like a sort of male non non entity producer as as like the player surrogate. And lots and lots of cute girls who may or may not be biologically female. Um, but this one is, you've got sort of a non-entity girl character as your main audience surrogate. And then all of the other, like, random um, characters are cute boys of one variety or another, all of whom who have distinguishing characteristics. For it must be admitted, extremely generous definitions of cute. Yeah. Um, OGLink.com slash 4RR. And let's just move along. All righty. Next up is a big change. ARP Backstage Pass. Where yeah, watching got... these in alphabetical order is a real kick in the pants. Where, by golly, it's the entertainment industry looking at itself again. Where here we have a boy idol group. Where for... Relatively nondescript pretty boys are, you know, deliberately headhunted for a new boy idol group, um, which I guess is a real thing, and this is sort of an anime tie-in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it has CGI animation. Yeah. Um, animation seems perfunctory aside from the dance numbers which are where the cgi animation comes in and, this and, is... and it's actually extra disturbing there's a lot of flapping hands that you don't normally get in these cgi routines so like their arms are going up and down up and down all the time yeah um... i mean so so like this show as a whole i think was not completely as bad as some of them i mean this isn't <laughs> the one where each character is you know reciting his or her excuse me his catchphrase this is a, a you know boy band show mm -hmm. and our bland uh, female protagonist um it's meant to be sort of a deep look into the backstories and lives of these actual idols who are being animated on the screen and they even talk about how that they are going to be in this very anime that you are watching right now um uh... Yeah, there's an extended bit where uh, violin music plays, classical violin, and it goes on for a freaking long time. Yeah. Uh, this is a show that does not know what to do with its screen time. Yeah. Um, the, the basic idea is that in episode one, you're introduced to all the members of the group. There are four of them. And then you get a little um, scene examining their backstory. Like one of them was a classically trained violinist who could never satisfy his father um, who wanted him to become a world-class violinist, and he just, he never had that oomph to, to take it over the top in the classical violin recital world, so he wound up being recruited for the ARP project. Then there were two guys who were 
kind of their own rock band and busking on the streets and they get recruited. Um, and then the last guy is, is this kid Leon who is just, Oh my God, he's so cheerful and ganky and willing to try anything to make the group a success. Um, it's just like he fling himself, you know, arms spread wide onto, you know, the idle experience. This is nothing special. This is the same old kind of boy band show that you get with bad 3D CG stuff. Um, there's nothing nothing unique about this. Mm. If you want a boy band show, fantastic. This is a boy band show. Um, anything else? There is nothing else. <laughs> Um, and that's it. I mean, it's, uh, I would say is a complete waste of time. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I have to say that after, you know, sort of being able to tolerate most of the show, they hit the end where they have the live animation while the idols improvise banter with each other. And it is as poison, poisonously inane as any examples of that genre I've seen. So it makes up for its blends at the end with. Yes, yeah, I, I do not see what the appeal of, of this kind of um, structure in an entertainment show is. I mean, presumably... Like there are radio shows in Japan where you just have your idols show up and, and just like talk about nothing or take calls from their fans. And it's it's all extremely punishingly lightweight. And to to do this in a in a TV show, I guess, is trying to replicate that experience. But I just don't see how. How how it is as edifying as like the live experience it would be. It's not. Um, OGlink.com slash 4R5. Okay. Um, Paul, could you give a shot at the next title? Sure. It is Boku no Tenari ni an Koku Hakai Shin Gaimas. And this is Which trans, is? A destructive god sits next to me. And this is it kind of gave me flashbacks to uh, stuff like um, My Neighbor Seiki and Haruhi um, because the whole premise of this is that you've got a guy in class who is trying real hard to study and he's just perpetually distracted by the antics of the students around him. And that's that's about it. So I have to say I had saved this one for last Um hoping that it might, in fact, be a bit of uh, My Neighbor Seiki-kun, mm -hmm. and it is not. It is much more uh, an exemplar of the Chunibyo show, mm -hmm. which is the eighth grade disease, as it's called. The What's idea that? that, you know, when you're in eighth grade, just this anime stuff is so cool and you want to spend all your time imagining that you are some powerful figure and you've got powers and you, you know, run around school in your black trench coat. Not in Japan, no black trench coats, but that would be sort of the equivalent of the U.S. Uh -huh. And uh, this is not a fine example of the genre. There was one last season. Its, it's name is eluding me. I'll have to, to look it up here in a second. That was a, a better example. <laughs> uh, with a girl who's dropped into a club of, you know, four of these bozos, each of who have their own little weird thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't good, but it was better than this. This is just kind of a, a mean show with our three characters just banging into each other constantly. Uh, the joke is that our main character, you know, is over it. But he has to sit next to his, you know, his friend who's really into this. And he keeps just you know, doing this manzai routine with him where he does something wacky and chuny. And yeah, and that's basically it. And then there's a, the third friend is just a jerk. Yeah, that's that's about it. I mean, uh, the only thing that, that is unusual about this is our, quote, regular guy, straight man, um, is some sort of like... Nekomimi guy, he, well, he's an Inomimi because he has dog ears and a dog tail. Um, and this makes him the regular guy in the group because his, um, I guess, classmate is this weirdo who thinks he's an anime character, wears an eye patch, and is just desperately trying to insert drama into every little thing around them that happens to make it... 
um, like like he's a a big heroic character and such and such is his nemesis and this thing that's happening is a terrible magical trial and it, it he just like spends the whole episode declaiming nonsense like this while the dog guy is is just perpetually surprised and astonished by it all and of course distracted from learning anything in school is he actually meant to be a dog guy i wasn't sure if that was just like a stylistic thing or if he's actually like wearing ears in class i mean this Uh, was never touched upon i think it was never explicitly mentioned and you're right for a long time i was just like oh he's got this like stupid looking haircut that looks like dog ears but then i noticed he's also got a tail and so i think the haircut is actually supposed to be like real dog ears Okay, I so guess. the show I was thinking of from last season was Chu Byo Geki Hatsu Boy. Okay, well, this is oglink.com slash 4R6. <laughs> okay, so next up is Doro Hedoro. Oh, boy. It's hard to know what to do with this one. Uh, this is sort of a grim and gritty dystopian fantasy world where magic users fight each other with battle magic. It um, is aggressively weird and even more aggressively uh, brutal. Mm-hmm. It's aiming for sort of a, you know, not quite surrealist, but like we are going to just put some weird shit on the screen. And it's going to come, you know, one thing after another. We've got a guy who's got a head like a lizard and he's, you know, fighting somebody else and he bites somebody's head and the guy sees somebody's face down this guy's throat and is talking to him. Um. And that's as yeah. far as we were able to to figure out because, I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening in this show, but not a whole lot of stuff being explained really clearly. So, I mean, I think that the, the cold open is actually pretty promising mm-hmm. as a show. I mean, it has a interesting visual style. I mean, the 3D CG is janky uh, and it has kind of an odd art style mashed up with the, the CG-ness of it. Um, and... Yeah. Like there's this bit where one of the uh, magic users that our two characters are fighting goes through a door that opens up in the street. And the girl who's fighting with with the lizard or the caiman guy says, you know, finally they left a door behind that so so we can follow them or whatever. Uh And, you know, so that's like a good open, except they don't actually do anything with the door. And then it just goes on with the rest of the show. And the characters march through ever more brutal combats, including one where a girl's face is accidentally ripped off with lizard guy's teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, I go, go ahead. So this you know how most anime usually tries to go for stylish and cute and both of that. This one is just going for like weird and and I don't know, kind of off putting. Yeah, I mean if it had the the weirdness and the off puttingness of it don't actually work that well together is the problem. Mm. Uh if it sort of embraced one or the other a little more uh, it might find a bit more of an audience. Uh, because for me, I mean, I, I kind of was interested in it at the start. I The characters could potentially work. I mean, actually, the, 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 the Cayman character is kind of interesting. I mean, he's kind of a comedic character, which is unusual. He's sort uh, of like a lizard dinosaur man. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, Kind of, and his partner's uh, you know extremely beefy lady who works in a restaurant that doesn't have any customers. <laughs> and in the opening credits, she is just going to town on a cut of meat with some electric uh, cleavers. Um, and and you know, it could work, but it ends up working less and less well for me as the episode went on. And by the end, I was done, just done. Yeah. I mean, they throw a lot of interesting concepts here um, up on the wall to see what sticks, but they don't really form a cohesive picture. It's just a, a bunch of stuff happening and maybe they're going to explain it better down the line. I would hope. I'm not sure yeah, if like I when really want to. Like wanna... when the woman's face gets ripped off, it's like, well, uh-huh. that was a thing. And like for everybody, that's basically, it's just a thing. But they spent mm. a lot of screen time sort of getting into that happening and then just moved on. So. Yeah. They they throw up interesting ideas and then just abandon them like instantly. 
Okay, well, this is um, uh, information Not is available via the wiki. Uh, I don't know if this was picked up. I, I don't believe this one is licensed yet. No. Um, oglink.com slash 4R7. Okay, so next up is Drifting Dragons, which is um, CGI animated. It's about people on an airship who go out and they hunt sort of like sky dragons, although they don't really look like traditional dragons. They look sort of like krakens or octopi or squids or something. They look like big 3D CG renderings have a lot of spikes. Yeah. Um, so basically the whole idea is that, you know, the airship is kind of like a whaling vessel and the sky dragons are, are like whales, except they're not peaceful giants of the sea. They're vicious monsters of the air and they, they need to be taken down for the good of human settlements. And, uh, I don't know. It, it just kind of reminded me as, as of being derivative of, all the other shows we've set on, we've seen set on airships, starting from, you know, Miyazaki's Castle in the Sky to, uh, what was that one with Lavi a couple of years oh, ago? Oh, Last, Last Exile. Exile. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, it's sort of like, okay, here we go. Here's our, our plucky band of protagonists. They're bounty hunters. They they hunt whales, you know, space, you know, sky dragons instead of whales and that's their their bounty hunter gig. Mm. Yeah, so we can't talk about this show without talking about the 3D CG because this is some of like the weirdest executed 3D CG I've seen. I mean, it felt like I was watching a, a PS3 cutscene at times. Uh, it's, it's like one of the criticisms often le le leveled against the use of 3D CG in anime is that they artificially slow the frame rates. Right. So mm -hmm. it looks kind of jerky. In this case, it is like bizarrely high frame rate and liquid for a lot of the pans if, until you like get shots of the characters doing something. And then the characters like jump from frame to frame in <laughs> just distressing ways. Mm. Uh, and then the 3D characters are like, you know, composited on these backgrounds that have nothing to do with the characters in front of them, like these long shots of the mountains in the background. And it has, you know, there's no unity of scene or design. Um, now, now, this is a real disappointment because Bryce was really bullish on this one mm -hmm. uh, from the manga. He's read the manga. He says the art is fantastic. In it. Oh, OK. And, and so I can see that something like these dragons, I mean, you know, pen and ink, good line art could be fantastic. Um, in this, they ju they're just a mass of, you know, seat of rendering. You know, they look like rendered objects from 10 years ago. Um, yeah. Uh, Bryce's <laughs> other comment on this is that they spend an awful lot of time talking about how the dragons are prepared as food in great detail. And we do get a bit of that in this first episode. Uh, there's one of the characters who is extremely focused on, you know, preparing dragon steaks and, and so on. Uh, to the extent of trying to avoid killing the sky dragons in, in, in certain particular manners because it will toughen up the meat when you, you know, butcher and eat them later um let's see there's like a cute girl who is i guess sort of our protagonist character and of course there's the ace who is like the totally cool and unemotional super duper skilled you know dragon slayer guy um, yeah, I mean, one of the side effects of the art style, as well as the exposition uh, approach, is that I found it very hard to tell these characters apart. Like the two guy characters, the captain and the ace or whatever, um, I just couldn't tell which of them was talking on the screen. Uh... So, and, and I also like didn't care about any of the cast. Uh, so it's like when the girls, when the women show up on the screen, it's like, well, okay, I guess. So... And, and that and unfortunately, that was kind of what I was left with at the end of this show was, well, OK, I guess, um, you know, there could have been something here. I don't think the show is going to deliver it. Um, I might check out the manga because it sounds like it will be a better experience. Hmm. Um, OGlink.com slash 4RM as in Mary. OK, next up is Ishozuku Reviewers. And this is sort of. 
you know, a show that we as podcasters should like because it's about people wandering around and sampling things and giving reviews on them, except that this is a hentai show and what they're sampling and reviewing is various non-human women at brothels in a fantasy D&D world. Yep, that's basically it. Yeah. Um, yep, there's, there is your high concept. Yep. That's the only concept this thing has. Yeah. For for um, some reason there's there's a silly dynamic where they post reviews of their brothel dives on the wall of the tavern where they all hang out and people give them money for this. Which subsidizes further brothel expeditions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that... The, the 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 character dynamics in addition to I mean, so like we won't get to the concept just yet just, let's just look at like the the basic characters the characters are terrible to watch on the screen there are a human dude and an elf dude yeah and they are just like yep that's all they want to talk about is uh you know the uh, prostitutes that they have slept with recently uh but they don't you know just like do it to themselves they're shouting this out in the uh in the tavern they are trying mm -hmm. to make the waitress as uncomfortable as possible you know and, you know touching her inappropriately because Ooh. that's funny that's comedy um yeah, and then we get into sort of, I mean, the, the, this is not what I would call a sex-positive show. I mean, this is not a nuanced portrayal of sex workers. Mm -hmm. This is a, you know, this is a chance to l l draw uh, anime girls with, a, you know, ludicrously large memories and to talk about their cloacas. <laughs> and I do wish Literally, I were Literally, in one case. About that. Yes, they talk. Uh, a good third of the episode is d devoted to talking about, you know, the properties of sleeping with parakeet women. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Vital was... research information. If you're ever going to be in that situation, I would think. Yeah, so, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I think I think at, by this point, you know, if you're in the market for this show and even then you're still probably going to be disappointed if you watch it. OGLink.com slash 4RO takes you over to ANN link for details. Okay, so the next show is Toilet Bound Hanako Kun or Jibaku Shonen Hanako Kun. And uh, this is kind of interesting in a minor way because it starts out with um, sort of these um, schoolgirls in that blacked out silhouette look where. The, the convention is that, yes, they're saying something, but it doesn't really matter who they specifically are. So you just see them in sort of silhouette form. And they're telling the ghost story of the third bathroom stall and the girls' restroom on the third floor of the old school building, where if you go in there and summon Hanako, you will be granted a wish. And so, of course, there's a schoolgirl who hears this story and she's like, well, I'm trying to get Senpai to notice me. Um, you know, even though I've declared my love to him, he does not reciprocate. So I'm going to go and ask the ghost in the bathroom stall mm -hmm. to help me win his heart. And so she goes up there and summons Hanako. And it turns out that Hanako is not some schoolgirl who, like, died in the toilet somehow or another, like Moaning Myrtle from the Harry Potter stories. Mm -hmm. Hanako is actually a boy who's haunting the girl's restroom for unspecified reasons, which he is actually embarrassed to sort of talk about in open conversation. Um, but anyway, she, pers she persists, and he is sort of actually cautioning her that she really doesn't want to have a wish granted by him because as a ghost, he, he must extract some sort of commensurate price from her in exchange for granting the wish. So he initially tries to skive off of it by basically just offering a whole bunch of sort of like best friend things like, well, have you tried making a lunch for him? And... <laughs> Um, you should you should you should try and involve him in in your talents. And since she's in the gardening club, she basically puts vegetables on his desk, and everybody thinks that Pixies did it or something like that. Uh, fox spirits. Fox spirits. Did you save a fox? Yeah. That's what they ask. Yeah. So, you know, after all of her, you know, 
incredibly prosaic and mundane tactics sort of fall through. She's like, oh, come on, you're a ghost. You've got to have something magic you can do for me. And he's like, well, there is this one thing. I have these matchmaking stones. And she's like, great, give me those. And you find out, you know, they're not really all they're cracked up to be. And uh, the, the long and short of it is that she nearly gets her darn self killed. And he basically saves her from a spirit that's like bigger and meaner than he is by adopting her as his assistant to pay off um, the debt. And, and, th and th thus we have a premise for the series. Yeah. So all of episode one is, is basically just sort of like going through the paces of setting up the, uh, the premise for the rest of the series. It's basically two characters, right? This is mm -hmm. all the interaction between these two. I mean, you get, you know, the antagonist who shows up briefly at one point. You get little shots of the other girls in the background. Uh, maybe a shot of one of the guy love interests. But really, it's all about the dynamic between these two characters. Yeah. And, you know, the setup of, you know, the way the urban legends go at these schools. If there are seven wonders of the school of whom, you know, Hadako-kun is the seventh. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so there's going to be sort of these magical mysteries of the week, I would guess. Uh, uh, they are going to be, you know, going on occult adventures together. I gotcha. Sort of like Ushio and Tora or Inuyasha yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and they've got kind of a, a, a fairly good sort of, not quite bonsai dynamic, but a little bit. You know, they're playing off of each other uh, in ways that are less annoying than that dynamic often is, I think, in shows like this. Yeah, so. and uh, I think the art style of this show is kind of interesting because they, they like doing this sort of like very heavy outline um, silhouette on the characters as their story is unfolding to sort of like give you the impression that you're watching an illustrated storybook, which I thought mm. was actually kind of innovative. Yeah, the character designs as well are uh, stylized a bit differently than normal. And mm -hmm. I th it's, you know, it's weird for like, you know, three minutes when you start watching. After that, I think it works quite well to give the show a distinctive look. Uh, the art's quite good as mm -hmm. well. I mean, I, I enjoyed watching this show all the way through, I have to say. Yeah, so cautiously optimistic, I think, is, is my reaction. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah, cautious, cautious is about right. I mean, this will probably get a couple more episodes to see if it if it holds my attention. But the first one was good enough that I think it's worth that shot. All righty. So where is this available? Have fun animation. Yeah, um, oglink.com slash 4R9. All right. And next up is in slash Spectre. Or uh, Kyoko Sweetie. All righty. So what is this show? Oh, it's a yokai show. Okay. It is. But uh, yeah, go, go ahead. This was, this was another interesting one. Uh, our protagonist is sort of a teenage girl who walks with a cane and wears a beret. And you later find out that she has um, the left leg missing sort of like, what, above the knee, I would say? Right around there, yeah. And she's uh, lost her right-hand eye as a result of an encounter with yokai. Um, and as such, she is drawn into the world of yokai, and she is sort of like their, their human intermediary. They call her the goddess of wisdom because just being a simple human girl, she's able to sort of apply a common sense um, solution mindset to the problems of the yokai, which, you know, for all their horrible, you know, yokai powers, they're not really able to see the larger picture beyond their own little, you know, slot. As she says, they're not very smart. Yes. Um, and for some reason, she is um, drawn to this older boy who visits the hospital where she gets her checkups um, fairly frequently. And it's something about him just gives the yokai the willies. And she's intrigued about what it could possibly be since he seems like a incredibly normal guy. He doesn't seem to do anything unusual or weird. Um, the only thing that, that's happened to him recently is his girlfriend dumped him. 
So what's the big mystery with this guy? And in order to get to the bottom of this mystery, we have an awful lot of talking. Uh, this sh show is very much about dialogue and repartee. Mm -hmm. And about characters, you know, sort of engaging in dialectics with each other. Um, Which this, I thought was, uh, was I, interesting. I, I was, yeah, I got interested uh, sort of in the, the background of this as I started watching it. And I, and I found that it's by the same author as uh, Zetsubu no Tempest, Blast of Tempest. I'm not sure if we've done that one for the show. If not, we probably should. But it had a similar sort of talky style to it mm -hmm. and was, again, interesting all the way through. That one had, was uh, sort of loosely based on some Shakespeare bits or at least kept mixing them in. Uh, uh, this, I think, has a quite a high production value on it. I mean, I enjoyed sort of watching the art on the screen, uh, you know, does good things with with uh, camera angles while the characters are talking to each other, which is good because if you just had static shots of these characters, you know, yammering mm. back and forth at each other, it would not be so hot. Uh, but, you know, as it goes on, you, know, you get more and more of these, you know, yokai doings mixed in, in uh, surprising or at, by the end, uh, quite threatening and violent ways. Oh, yeah. There's there's a reason why people are um, rightfully afraid of uh, yokai and want to, you know, appease them as much as they can. Um, because, you know, you mess around with the yokai, they'll just, like, snatch you and carry you off, and that'll be the end of you. Yeah. And by the end of the episode, we do get the, the revelation for why uh, this dude is, you know, feared by the yokai or why they have this, you know, sort of... You know, re toxic reaction to him. Hmm. Um, and I think it's a, a fairly decent setup for uh, what comes after. I mean, this I, this show didn't really do a lot to, to sort of sell me on the premise or the characters or like their motivations. Uh, I'm willing to sort of give it a few episodes to see if they can manage to sort of ground it a little more. So they've got their high concept, you know, they've got their... Mm -hmm character dynamic i mean this you know 17 year old girl and the college student you know she's she really likes him but she is super intellectual about it in terms of the way she's approaching it <laughs> um, so yeah could, mm -hmm. could, could go either way i'd say ogling.com slash four r a all righty so let's see 227 nanaboon no Needs you uh, Yeah, it's basically uh, 22 sevenths. Nandabun no needs you uh, Which is, as many will know, an, a, a, uh, an approximation for the numeral pi. Ah, okay. So that is a, a short rational approximation of pi, which is frequently used. Gotcha. And this is another idle show. Um, in this case, eight random girls receive an invitation to meet in a zoo, of all places, um, from a talent agency which says, once they all get there, that they're not there to audition to become idols. They have been pre-selected by a mysterious organization with serious backing and possibly some sort of weird supernatural um, entity at the center of it all, where they're to form an eight-girl idol troupe and... Obey the orders of the glowing wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this this is a show that isn't quite sure what it wants to do with its storytelling. Uh, we spend much of this episode in sort of the uh, viewpoint of one of these eight girls, and she is painfully shy. She's stuck in a service job but cannot talk to people. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, is about the most unlikely person to be an idol as, as can be imagined. Yeah. Uh, but she's also extremely depressed and down on everything. And so that ends up being sort of the tone of this entire episode is everything sucks. Yeah. And you counteract it. She gets dropped in with this group of seven other girls who are all, as near as I can tell, put there only to be unpleasant and entitled and 
or, you know, straight up idiots, but they're, basically they're all sniping at each other from moment one. Mm -hmm. And they get dropped into this ludicrous multi-story facility. We get a, a map scrolling through all of it and shots of the girls, you know, engaging in singing lessons before we get the wall. The wall. Which is uh, some sort of like bizarre ziggurat kind of edifice made of gold and it glows with an unearthly light. And presumably, although this has never been known to happen previously, instructions in the form of letters or something like that fall down a slide and land in at the bottom of the chute for the, the designated idols to immediately and wholeheartedly put into effect. But as the uh, gigantic uh, producer character says to them, this has never happened before. So, mm. I mean, this show really just does not have its shit together, I gotta say. It, it's... And at the end, the wall finally speaks. It finally sends a little engraved metal token tumbling down the chute, and it says, welcome to the idol group. Dun, dun, dun! It says, welcome to, you know, 22 stroke 7, which is the first time that's been mentioned at the course of this episode, and you're wondering, you know, like, there's nothing What the hell's round. that? Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing round in this episode. There's eight <laughs> girls. I mean, give us something to work with here. So, yeah. it's it's both trying to be too grounded and too high concept at the same time, I think. Um, yeah, I did not like any of the characters in this show. Yeah. Um, our, our viewpoint character is named Mimi and you're, you're sort of left feeling that at one point she was a, a like creative and expressive type, but then her life turned to shit and now she's like deliberately abandoning that because the world is harsh and dreams won't put money, you know, food on the table, dreams won't pay the rent. Um, she's got an ailing mother, the father's absent, and she's the only person in the family who's there to support mom and her, like, five-year-old little sister and pay the rent on their apartment and go to high school at the same time. And she has a job, so her, her, her she's basically spent, like, the last X number of years having the optimism and romanticism ground out of her. And now this idol organization wants to just like conscript her into a happy, cheerful, false smiles idol group. And she's like, you've got to be bullshitting me. And she actually spends the last five minutes of the episode ranting about what bullshit it is and mm -hmm. how she hates them all. And she's going to, you know, do she's just going to be an idol for them because fuck the world. Yeah, because and, at, at, yeah. At, one, at one point she loses her crappy retail job because the boss says that she's not social enough and doesn't smile enough and doesn't chat with the customers. And she's like, I work hard. And you're firing me because I'm not chatty enough? Okay. OGLink.com yeah. slash 4RN as in Nancy. Yeah. As in uh, not to watch. So anyway, so speaking of horrible travesties of good humor, we come to Oda Cinnamon Nobunaga. And this oh. is the the token Oda Nobunaga show of, of the anime season where the... The warlord of the Warring States period, Oru Nobunaga, is the central character one way or another in an anime series. And this year, the series is about Nobunaga after he is killed and is reborn as a Shiba Inu dog. That's it. That's the whole concept. As are yeah. all of the other warlords from the Warring States period, they are reborn as other different breeds of dog in his neighborhood. And this fantastic concept is, I think this could probably get, you know what, uh, like a minute, 30 seconds, two minutes if you stretch it of screen time uh, to sort of get that idea out there, you know, do your rim shot and, and, and fade out, right? That's what we get, right, Matt? Yeah, this this feels very heavily to me like it's adapted from a four coma comic strip, just a four panel gag comic, um, because it just seems like they set up something 
make a make a, a setup a further setup for it and then there's a, a joke and a reaction and then they go to an eye catch like I swear to God this show has got more eye catches than any anime I've seen in like the last 10 years. Um, and then it's another joke, another setup, and it's all the same fish out of water gag that this cute, fluffy little dog has the spirit of Odu Nobunaga, and uh, he's but it's the instincts of a dog, but, so he's gonna act like a yeah. dog. So, on the one hand, he's sitting around figuring out what fellow warlord it was who betrayed him, you know, back in the 16th century. At the same time, he's like going for walkies. And getting belly rubs. Yeah. Um, OGLink.com slash 4RB. For yeah. This is uh, available from Crunchyroll. Yeah. And let's see. This is another one. Science fell in love, so I tried to prove it. Like nga koi ni ochita, excuse me, ochita no de shome shite mita. Yeah. And this is basically sort of like a romance it, it feels like it came out of a light novel adaptation do you know anything about that no uh i don't it, it feels a little more uh sort of uh joke setup uh punchline to me okay so i'm guessing more manga um well basically this is about a science lab where the only way i can tell they do science is they have computer terminals and they all wear lab coats um, where you've got five scientists who work together. Um, they're kind of like otaku because they're intellectual nerds. Um, but one day, the, the hot chick female scientist um, just blurts out that she thinks she might be in love with her male co-worker. And she has pie charts to prove it. And then he doubts it because this is what a sample size of one. Right. So the whole gimmick is that um, they're they're both such incredible nerds that they decide that they need to come up with a scientific protocol to determine if they really are in love. And they they go through just all variety of silly and embarrassing juvenile experiments, largely lifted from romance manga. Um, to determine quant, quant, yeah, quantitatively if they are in love. It's about as awkward as you can expect from the description. So compared to the last one where you had one joke, this basically has one joke, but they're coming at it a lot of different directions. I have to give them credit for that. And, you know, they take a premise, then they'll keep developing that premise and developing it a little bit more. And so it's sort of, it's more how to the ludicrous length that they're taking these ideas they come up with. Uh, that's sort of meant to be the source of the humor. Yeah. Um, also, there is a, uh, a science bear mascot who will occasionally pop up to give you sort of like Entry level explanations for various things like what is a null hypothesis? Mm. So, yeah. Um, yep. OGLink.com slash 4RC. It's not the worst of the things we've watched. That's true. I mean, it's it's like sort of painful and awkward. But then again, I get I gather that's sort of supposed to be the point that you're supposed to feel love you're not supposed to analyze love and that's the joke yeah and the whole joke is that they you know just keep you know trying to you know shove the the round peg into the square hole i just don't know how many episodes you can get out of this concept yeah. one you can get one episode out of it <laughs> yeah well and that's <laughs> that's what we got that was what i was gonna watch so yeah. I, I'm, no, no more of this one for me yeah. i mean it wasn't terrible but yeah not enough there in terms of um how far they can take this premise, I think. Yeah, but the lady scientist is sexy in a sort of, you know, glasses and lab coat kind of way. No. Yeah. Okay, so what do we have next? Next up, we have Smile Down the Runway. Uh, runway de Warate. Um, and the basic premise is that we have a girl who is slim, attractive, and good-looking, and you would think ideal modeling material, especially since her own father owns a modeling agency. 
Alas, she is too short. She's 158 centimeters tall and has reached that stage where it is unlikely that she is ever going to grow any taller, which is a problem since, as you know, the fashion model industry is just hyper-focused on girls who not just have the look, but fit the mold. They have to be like 178 to 180 centimeters tall, and that's it. And if you're not that size, you won't fit the dresses, you don't have the image they need, and there's just no point in you even pursuing a career in fashion modeling, period. And we hit this revelation for her very quickly as this show opens up, uh, where her father effectively fires her from his own agency uh, because she won't (laughs) give up this ludicrous idea that she wants to walk down the runway at Paris. Mm -hmm. And he's like, come on, you know, there's lots of modeling things you can do. She goes, nope, that's it. So he's like, okay, out you go, kid. But she continues to bash herself against this wall and bash herself against the wall over and over and over. Until, fortuitously, she stumbles across this guy in her high school who is an aspiring fashion designer. He doesn't want to go to college for it, but he's really good at, you know, just sort of knocking together his own designs and then, you know, making them for people. And he likes to make people feel happy with his clothing. And it turns out that his vision is exactly the kind of vision that she needed for her own look to convince people that she really did have a serious chance of becoming a successful model, despite her hideous deformity height-wise. And uh, one of the problems here is that you know, with this character, uh, Chiyuki, she is just totally self-obsessed and annoying. I mean, there's no reflection. There's no, you know, I'm going to, you know, work hard and overcome this or whatever. So it's it's just, I'm entitled to this. I want it. If I just keep doing this, I'm going to get it. Mm. And by the end, it does look like, in fact, that's what's going to happen. Uh, now, her, her the male counterpart of this, Tsumura, uh, his, he has a much sort of more appealing arc. You know, he's, you know, a hard luck case. He's not from privilege and Mm -hmm. wealth. He is from a a poor family. He's got sisters. You know, one of the sisters isn't going to college because it's too expensive. Another sister is probably going to do, you know, a volleyball scholarship. His youngest sister is five years old Mm -hmm. and he needs to get a job to bring in money. And yeah, it's, and through the circumstances of the second half of this episode, basically, you know, we get to the point where he is poised to have his own breakout. And I thought that arc was great. I mean, that's sort of why you turn to a show like this, you know, the, you know, the, the start from zero mm-hmm. up from unpromising beginnings to the heights of success uh, through your own, you know, grit and hard work and talent and, and you know, good luck. <laughs> and, yeah. And really awesome clothing designs in this case. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but overall, this this first episode felt a little unbalanced, I'd say, and the, and Sumura is maybe a little too self-effacing. Mm. Um, you know, he's a little too too much um, too humble. You think? Yeah, compared to Chiyuki's, you know, just total confidence. Mm. So that it may, which makes both of them a little less interesting as human characters as opposed to these icons being paraded before us. So uh, this is the type of thing I might put on like some evening, maybe four or five weeks into the season when I'm doing the dishes just to, you know, watch a couple and see if there's anything there. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think there'd be more than that, but it could also be watchable. I mean, I'm not totally against watching more of this one. Who knows? It could develop into something more insightful than just um, she needs a hot new look. He comes up with it every week. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, OGLink.com slash 4RD for runaway drama. Yes, <laughs> this is uh, available from Funimation. Yeah. And that's the end of our full-length new shows. Um, as usual for this uh, format, we are not dealing with continuations or spinoffs or yada, yada, yada. But we do have one more short to uh, to talk about. 
And that is... It is Rebirth for You. And, and this thing, uh, everything you need to know about this are the opening words, which are the English phrase, Taledegu Kado Game. Yeah, this is just taking place in a world where the Rebirth trading card game is the be all and end all of human society culture and knowledge and uh, the only social prestige people in this world have is how good they are at this trading card game yeah. I'm sure it's a product tie in from somewhere but I honestly did not care enough to google it um, oglink.com slash 4rp um, I you know I don't even give it justice to give it an acronym. Um, okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I think that concludes everything for at least the winter season, right? And uh, we won't be doing any more of those kind of shows for a while. Uh, let's hope at least for another three months. <laughs> yeah. No, Alan, there's twelve more shows for next week. Well, good. We're not watching them, and <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to review them either. Um, yeah. Please allow me to comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, yes, and Bryce had family commitments, so he quote couldn't watch this awesome anime with us. Uh huh. Hey. Yeah, exactly. I'll bet he does. I'll just bet he does. <laughs> yeah. He's probably sitting around somewhere eating soft serve ice cream right now. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna close up because um, <laughs> it's it's important that we do that. The show will never end. Um, so thank you everyone for you know. All the things um, you want to <laughs> you want to find out all the links. Uh, it was oglink dot com slash og seven six four. Uh, you can check out our website triple generation dot net or just ognetworks dot tv. Um, what are we going to do next week? Good question. It won't be more of these shows. That's a guarantee. Um, so you'll find out on Wednesday because that's when we podcast. Uh, okay, so for feedback, you can always hit us up. Um, oglink.com slash feedback will take you into Discord. You can hang out with us there. Um, you want to become a Patreon supporter, oglink.com slash Patreon. And that, I think, concludes all the things that need to talk about, except asking Matt, you got a fortune? <laughs> yes, um, I do. Um, this week's fortune cookie to guide you through the upcoming week is Actions Speak Nothing Without Motives. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone enjoy that, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>